Hey, I'm so excited to get to teach this morning. I want to send out a special thank you to Pastor Jarrett for teaching last Sunday while Becky and I were discovering that good things come in pairs and we had a chance to be grandparents to those cute little twins. I just thought you needed some pictures. It's long overdue. So with that, I thought in celebration, you have twins, I thought in celebration this would be twin day. So good things come in twos, right? Like macaroni and cheese. Like you get a pair of shoes. Or you get a pair of earrings. Or there's peanut butter and jelly. Which, by the way, is my nickname for Pastor Brent Johnson. P-B-J. Pastor Brent Johnson. You see Brent, you just start thinking, peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And now we have Pastor Jarrett, but he's just peanut jelly. There's no butter. But bookends come in twos. Think about all the different things that come in twos. And how are we celebrating that in Philippians? Well, I'm going to give you two different lessons in one Sunday. This is like a twofer. People who are showing up late, doesn't matter. You'll be here for the whole second lesson. People who want to leave early. I'm, I, Tim doesn't want to leave early. He's got to leave at 10. You'll get a whole lesson before you leave. That's okay. Don't leave yet. No, you don't leave yet. So here's lesson number one. Lesson number one is on unity. And this lesson I'm going to divide into three parts. Now, i got to tell you something. If you're listening today, I don't, how, how many of you have been in church more than five years of your life? How many more than 10, 15, 20, 25, 30? Do I hear 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50? All right. I don't care how long you've been in church. I'm going to give you something today you've never heard of before. Maybe. But we're going to do it in three things. We're going to talk about the importance of unity. We're going to talk about Paul's plea for unity. And then we're going to talk about the application. So let's start with the importance of unity. I got to tell you, God cares deeply about unity. God cares deeply about unity. Look at this passage that Jesus had with his disciples, his apostles, right before he gets arrested, right before that night of prayer. Look at this passage and the select words that John included when he wrote down this dialogue Jesus had with his apostles. Jesus said the following in a, in a prayer to God. I do not ask for these only meaning his apostles, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's us. Jesus praying for us. And Jesus says that they may all be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us. Why? So that the world may believe that you've sent me. We want to evangelize this world. You want this world to come to Jesus. We need to be so united as a people. That the world is aghast. That the world takes notice. We live in a world that fractionalizes. We live in a world, we grow up in a world that fractionalizes. We live in America. <clears throat> There's a lot of good, incredible things about living in the United States of America. We have an economy that is vibrant and thrives in part because it's based upon competition. <clears throat> and some, someone will make more money if they can build a better mousetrap. And someone will get further in life if they get better grades. This idea is taught to us at a very young level. Coach is not the only one who deals in athletics. But what's athletics? It's not just get up and exercise. It's who wins. Do I have any Aggies in the house? <clears throat> yeah. Roll Tide all the way back home to Alabama. <laughs> With a flat tire. Do I have any Sooners in the house? 
Uh Uh-huh, you notice uh, Sam Harless is not in church today. I think he's probably still crying. We grow up in a culture that thrives on differences in so many ways. And those can be good things, but not in the house of God. In the house of God, the plea is for unity. And it's very hard because it just doesn't come naturally to us. But that's how the world's going to believe that Jesus sent us. That God sent Jesus. Because we will be different in our culture and in our world. So this idea that we've talked about with Paul, that Paul uses extensively, this idea of koinonia, of connectedness, of commonness, of sharing. The idea that Pastor Jeff just talked about before his prayer, that a life group or Jesus in the middle of of two different people, that connectedness, that's all about unity. Doesn't mean these aren't two different trees. But they're connected. They're one whole. Now why does this become important? We'll look at carefully at Paul's plea for unity. And then we'll do application and you'll be through with your first lesson. Here it is. The passage is from Philippians. <clears throat> I entreat Eudean, or Eudea in, in the English form. And I entreat Suntuke. To agree in the Lord. You're saying, Euodian, Suntuke, that looks like Yodia and Syntyche. Well, if you're from Lubbock, it does indeed look like Yodia and Syntyche. But if you've got the Greek reading next to it, you might as well pronounce it the way they do. So it is Yodia and Suntuke. I entreat Yodia and I entreat Suntuke. To agree in the Lord. Now we need to look at the Greek. And I want you to notice when we look at the Greek. There's some balance here that Paul's got. Paul has written this in a very balanced fashion. So I'm going to put the Greek back up here. But I'm going to put it up with the balance. Here's the English. I entreat Euodia. And I entreat, entreat Suntuke to agree in the Lord. Paul's writing is euodian parakalo. Parakalo is actually in modern Greek that means thank you. But in ancient Greek, in Koine Greek, the time of Paul, parakalo means uh, I'm asking. Uh, uh, I'm calling you to be with me on this. It's it's a compound word. I'm asking. So um, euodian, I'm asking. And then Paul adds this word and, kai, and then he says, Suntuchen parakalo. Now there's balance in the way he's done this. We can read it and we don't know exactly what the fussing point was between these two women. But it's probably a ministry related fussing point. It's not just personality driven. It's not they're mad over who ate, who, who you know, who's dessert at the church social or something like that. These are two women who are leaders in the church. And these two women have a dispute or a a disunity over a church matter, most likely. And it's very interesting because Paul writes so carefully not to take sides. He gives perfect balance. He calls them both by name. He puts their names in alphabetical order. You say, well, that sounds like a 21st century thing. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. They had ABC series. They had all sorts of reasons to put things in alphabetical order historically as well. He uses the verb with both. He names both of them, but he uses the verb with both of them. He wouldn't have to say that verb twice. He could just say parakalo, euodian, kai, suntukane. He could have just said, I entreat euodia and syntuke to syntuke to, to da 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 da. But with each of them, he names them and he uses the verb. 
He names them and he uses the verb. And he does it in perfect balance to show he's not taking sides here. He's not saying who's right and who's wrong. He's telling them, please agree in the Lord. This is a ministry issue that they're facing. By the way, interesting that it's women who have the ministry issue that he's confronting in Philippi. This should not go unnoticed. No, not, not in the sense that, gee, the women can't get along. In a sense that women are in leadership there. He's not saying, hey, men leaders get in there and fix this wagon. He's not telling women, you've got no place deciding ministry issues anyway. Paul recognizes, and, and you'll find it replete in Paul's writings, whether it's talking about Lydia, Aquila, and Priscilla. Uh, you, you know, there are women in leadership in that New Testament church, especially up in Macedonia, where the church in Philippi is located. <clears throat> if you go to, uh, this is a reconstruction slide that Janet Seifert found on the internet, but if you go to ancient Philippi, the Acropolis up at the top, this is the walled city. Everybody's down here. You can still find rocks with reliefs as you go up toward the top that show the particularly intensive role that women played in society there. Women were leaders. This Philippi was not one of these cities where the women were second-class citizens. Remember, the church started with a woman that Paul saw out in a place of prayer outside in the, where the river was, washing on the Sabbath. This is not a town where they had enough Jews to make a minion. They didn't have ten men who could form a synagogue. So this is a female-driven, in many ways, church. And the names on the Acropolis show the prominent roles of those women in public life. So within the framework of this, Paul urges with perfect balance these two people. By the way, Paul names the women. When Paul corrects people, he rarely names them unless they're his friends. Paul names the people he likes. The enemies he has that he doesn't like, one of the ways he just pff, pff, them is he doesn't even dignify using their names. They're anonymous. They who shall not be named. Pfft. And that's what he does. He just gives them the brush off by not even naming them. So Paul's naming these women. Paul sees these women as, as special and important, and he treats them with dignity and respect. And then he continues. And he says, yes... I ask you also, true companion, help these women who've labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Now, pause for a moment and look at this. <clears throat> it says in the Greek, it starts out, nigh, for yes. It's translated yes. Nigh is... Um, in Greek, nigh is, is like an exclamation mark. It's just saying that what I've just said and probably what I'm about to say is, is worthy of an exclamation mark. So you could, you could just write that nigh this way. I entreat Euodia and I entreat Sintuke to agree in the Lord. Exclamation mark. And then he says, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who've labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Exclamation mark. And that's his emphasis there. So he says, yes. And then he says, I ask, erato. Erato. Now he's just asked Euodia, Euodia and Suntuke. He's just asked them, but he used that word parakalo. 
and he shifts and he uses a different word for ask here. Let me tell you why. The word he used with the two ladies, I entreat, parakalo, that's very typical Paul. Paul uses that word a lot for asking. But then when he shifts to erato here, and he says, I ask, erato, erato is the same thing, but it's a little more polite. I was trying to think, I was talking to Becky, give me some equivalents. And we kind of came up with the idea in Spanish. You can say to someone, como estas, how are you? And it's very friendly. Or you can say, como esta usted, which is more respectful. There's an element of that here. But it's not just that Paul's saying something more respectfully. He's saying something more politely. So in, in my brain, it's, it, it's this idea of being more polite. It's this idea of almost saying, please. So the first one could just be, hey, I'm asking you, the way you would normally say it. But it's almost as this time it's, I'm asking you, please. And they translate the first one, I entreat you, I think in part because he says it twice. So he's just really asking them, please, you know, he's entreating them. But here he's using a very polite form. So it's almost, I also ask, please. And then he says, true companion. Ganesia uh, Suguke is, is uh, Suzuke is um, really interesting. Who's this true companion? Who's he saying, I'm asking you, true companion? The true companion would certainly know who he's talking about. This first word, Ganese, is, uh, is, it means genuine or authentic. Suzuke is a really interesting word. Now here's something that you may not have ever heard before. Here, we've got something for Janet Seifert and maybe a few others. Naz, this could be for you too. If Dr. Sherry's in here, it's for her. All right. This word, su, zuke, uh, is a compound. Hold on, we can do better than that. It is a compound word, and it's actually two words. Let's see if this works better. Is that easier to read? Su, which is soon. That just drops the N, means with. And zuke, let's put that into English letters. Z U, which can be translated into a Y. G, we get the word zygote from it. Zygote was in the late 1800s a term used for the when the woman's ovum is penetrated by a male sperm and the cell becomes, those become yoked together for all the DNA and you have one full cell, you've got a zygote. This means yoked. So this suzuke means yoked together. And it's a very unusual term in some ways to put into this context because it's generally in antiquity used of your spouse. So those people who believe Paul was married use this as one of their passages and say that Paul is asking his spouse who must still be in Philippi, some associate it with Lydia and think he married Lydia, think that Paul's saying, and I'm asking you, my genuine spouse, my true companion, to help out these ladies. Interesting concept, but it's hard to square with 1 Corinthians 7, 6 through 8, where at least at the time Paul's writing that letter, he says that he's single. So, 
people try to figure it out. But sometimes you're single. Sometimes you're engaged. Sometimes you're married. Sometimes you're single again. Sometimes you get married again. Mel's saying, that's right, as he sits there with his wife, Diane, on the front row, having lost his first wife. I, it, it's the same idea, maybe, who knows? But it's an interesting passage. That doesn't have to mean spouse. Oh, by the way, did I tell you? Our daughter Rebecca and Daniel Navid got engaged yesterday. That would be her with the shiny ring on her finger right over there. Wave, Rebecca, do that diamond wave. We were in the backyard and, and uh, uh, well, kind of the, the, the library park area, I guess is what we should say. Not the backyard, but the library park area behind our house. And uh, out of the blue, this helicopter lands and this James Bond debonair guy gets out and Rebecca starts freaking out as he walks over and drops to a knee and says, will you marry me with a ring? Perfect. Pretty incredible job there, Navid. Way to go, Daniel. Um, uh, and she didn't take long, what was it, about 30 minutes before you decided, Rebecca? No, I think it was immediate. And uh, 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 anyway, so it's fascinating. But whoever the true companion is, and it's probably, I tend to think it's probably Luke who was his travel buddy. Because if you read the narrative in Acts, it looks like Luke stayed behind in Philippi. Because up to Philippi, it's we did this, we did this, we did this. And after Philippi, it's Paul left and Paul did this and Paul did this and Paul did this. So Luke stayed behind in Philippi. Or maybe it was... Uh, Epaphroditus or whoever brought the letter back but Paul is asking the true companion and they would have known who it was to help Sulambanu is, is to help these women who have labored with him side by side in the gospel together with Clement and the wor rest of the fellow workers whose names are in the book of life now the book of life with names in it is a very very ancient Jewish concept goes all the way back to the second book of Moses in Exodus chapter 32 there's a reference to the book of life and it's one that's found repeatedly in the New Testament as well but there's a reference where we are read the following The next day Moses said to the people, you've sinned a great sin. I'll go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, alas, these people have sinned a great sin. They made for themselves gods of gold. If you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of the, your book you have written. It's this idea of a book of life that God has done. And so Paul grabs that and he says, look. We're all on mission together. And I want you to help these women find unity in the Lord. It's absolutely important. Paul says, I'm not taking sides, but please figure this out. And that's his plea for unity. Now the application, well, that depends. What divides the church today? Is the church divided by race? I hope not. Our church doesn't seem to be, but some churches are. And to the extent it is, we need to always, always guard against it. When racial turmoil frustrates this nation and captures press attention, Oh, what would the world think if they knew that the people of God had no room for racism in their body? That the people of God, of all races, could come together with full fellowship and full love. What a testimony to the world would that be? What divides the world of the church? Politics? I have a lot of you that I'm good friends with. 
And I have some of you, let me turn around so that I use your right and your left. I have some of you who if this is what most people would consider right wing. I have some of you <laughs> who are over here and I love you. And if this is considered middle of the road, I have some of you who are here and I love you. And I know some of you who are over here on the left. And I know some of you who are over here on the left. And it's almost like you can't believe those people over there even belong to Jesus. But that's okay because those people over there don't think you do either. <laughs> this has been my experience. I get emails from all ends of the spectrum from you guys. And it's okay to have a different view of politics. And it's okay if some of you voted one way and some of you voted another. I know, coach, you're going to find that hard to believe. It's okay. Be I'm joking. Coach has got a great mindset. It is okay as long as we don't let it destroy the unity in the church. If this country, which is so divided by politics, saw the body of Christ as people who saw beyond the way we interpret this for governing this country into a worldwide vision of the kingdom of God that has no division at all, even if we disagree on this issue or that issue, we do it in love and compassion with an overarching unity in the Lord. If we were that way, everything would shudder. All right, where else? How about worship styles? As my dad would say, now you quit preaching and went to meddling. <laughs> you know, I got to tell you, there's some stuff, I'll just be honest, there's some stuff we do in worship that is not my cup of tea. But I dare say it's some of y'all's cup of tea. And there's some stuff I'd like to do in worship that is my cup of tea. And I suspect y'all, if we did it, some of y'all would say, I don't like tea. <laughs> and I don't like this. And I've got to learn to worship the Lord in spite of my personal preferences. And it's a chore sometimes. There's some things that drive me batty. Including that big old camera that swings around in front of me and blocks my view. And I just keep waiting for someone to get hit so I can sue the church. <laughs> I'm joking. I do not sue churches. That was a total joke. But, you know, I, I look, and poor... Poor Pastor Brent Dyer, he's trying to satisfy all of us. Who'd have thunk? But I need to find unity in the church. And that starts with me. Unity is not, okay, I figured this out. Say, we're going to have unity in the church. You just need to agree with me. We'll be united. There you go. No, unity in the church means we're going to find how we do this thing together with love and the resurrected Lord in the middle. You know, some of its personality divides the church. Well, I don't like that personality. I don't like that personality. Okay. Sorry. You know, I mean, the, the, but we've got to get past that. One reason it's great to have 30 life groups or 50 life groups or 75 life groups is there are a lot of people that just don't like listening to me talk. Well, I don't blame them. Sometimes I get quite bored with myself. I got to meet uh, uh, Carol's grandson uh, this morning. 
And I told them, I said, okay, parts of class are going to be boring and parts of class are going to be interesting and your job is to try to tell the difference. <laughs> I, there, there are times where I'm like, you know, and, and sometimes I'm up here and I'm teaching and I say things that I find offensive. And I'm thinking to myself, my brain is thinking this while my mouth is talking. I'm thinking, do you realize what you just said, you idiot? That was stupid. That was offensive. But we need to find a common love for Christ that binds us together. Without regard to personality. Without regard to money. Without regard to to education, without regard to skin color, without regard to politics, without regard to worship preferences. We need to be a united people. So Becky and I and Rebecca were in the car last weekend when we were in Florida and we were headed over to the birthday something. And I don't know what happened, but Becky and I were just having a ball, just tearing apart the world. And Rebecca said, y'all need to say five nice things for every negative thing you say. Now, our, we weren't like saying really bad negative stuff. We were teasing because we have a tendency to tease each other. So we would say five nice things and then tease the other one and, and, and kept doing it that way, which was our way of saying to Rebecca, nano, nano, nano. But, um, you know, we need to be people who build up and love. So let's work at, together at being together. All right, the next lesson, that's, by the way, uh, that's, that's lesson one on unity. The next lesson, I don't have a lot of time. I got like 20 minutes. So can you handle one more lesson for 20 minutes? Okay, let's do one more lesson, and I won't get into the whole thing all the way. I'm going to skip over it lightly, just enough to get you maybe wetted for next week. All right? Here it is. This is about joy. Do you remember the song? Okay, that's all I can handle. Um, if you grew up, Rick, if you had grown up in this church or almost any church, when you were a kid, you'd have been singing that song. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart, down in my heart. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart to stay. Okay. That is the word that should be in there instead of unity. I misused the slide should say joy sorry um, three things on joy first Paul gives a memorable instruction second I want to talk about the meaning and third points to ponder let's get through these with some speed rejoice in the Lord always again I will say it rejoice now we used to sing that song in our youth group did y'all sing that rejoice in the Lord always and again I'll say rejoice it came from here. It's a great, pithy little statement. It's easy to put into a song. It's easy to remember. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll say rejoice. That's in English. But it's just as easy to remember. And it's just as pithy in the Greek. Maybe even more so. The Greek, kairate and kuriu pantote, palinero kairate. It's the same thing. Paul wrote this in a way to make it memorable. In other words, Paul wasn't just writing along, man, rejoice in the Lord. Oh, he wrote it in a form to make it easy to memorize. It's, he almost, it's like he wrote in the margin, this is your memory verse, you better have this down before I get there. See, in the Greek, it's got assonance, which is that idea I've talked about before of related sound like the rain in Spain falls mainly in the plain you know where you use the same sounds over and over to make something memorable it's also got what's called chiasm or chiasm where it it it's got this shape where it starts with an idea goes to another idea repeats that idea and then goes back to the first idea like an x or the letter key in the greek or chi so assonance, look at this. We've got related K sounds. Kyrate, kurio, kyrate. You've got not just related K sounds, but T sounds. Kyrate, pantote. 
kairate. So you've got related sounds. You've got not just those, but you've got related R sounds. Kairate, kurio, whoops, kurio, uh, ero, kairate. You've just got these repeated sounds. You've also got this chiasm that's happening. And, and, and I can break it out like this, and you can see idea one, idea two, idea two, idea one. And that's the way it's structured. It's called a chiasm because it's structured where if you folded it over, it'd be the exact same. It's, it's the Greek letter chi. Rejoice in the Lord, always, again. I'll say rejoice. And you just kind of can fold it over in the middle. Always and again, rejoice in the Lord. I will say rejoice. So, you know, sometimes I use a slide in here where I'll, I'll quote someone. And I've got to quote them because I can't take credit for what they say. So I'll put a picture of them and I'll say this person said this. Well, this time I'm going to quote me. Because I didn't want to forget to say this, but mercy, that fellow was clever. I mean, that's just good writing. What a clever, memorable instruction. Kyrate in curio, pantote, pollen, ero, kyrate. Easy to remember if you speak Greek, as easy as English. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. He gave something that was memorable, but not just something that's memorable, something that has meaning. And the root of kairate, rejoice, is that word joy. Cairo means to be in a state of happiness and well-being, to rejoice, to be glad. In fact, if you were walking down the street at the time of Paul, you could say, kairate which is you instructing someone in joy. May you be happy, well-being, rejoice, be glad. You could say it when you're leaving. It's kind of like aloha. It's, it's one of those double words. You say it when you greet them or say them when you say goodbye. Kairate. That might be the way you'd leave. Kairate. You're just wishing them shalom. Wishing them happiness and well-being, rejoicing and being glad. But here Paul's not saying goodbye. Or hello. Here Paul is giving an instruction. And he's instructing them to rejoice. To be filled with joy. We as Christians can be filled with joy. Because we worship and know a resurrected Messiah. Look at what Jesus said in John 16 20. In John 16 20, Jesus is about to go to the cross and he's having that dialogue with his apostles and he says the following. He says, um, you know, I'm headed there, you're going to be weeping uh, and all the rest. And he says, you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy, Cairo. When you encounter the resurrected Lord, your sorrow turns to joy. And that's what we have. So that's why Paul is able to say rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll say rejoice. And that form, Cairo, of this word, have joy, have happiness, have well-being, have a good day have a good life that verb is in the imperative form of the present tense present means right now at this moment right now imperative means he's instructing you to be that way he's saying you actually it's plural y'all rejoice well not today I don't feel like it I didn't ask you if you felt like it yeah, but I have sorrow. That's okay. You can have sorrow. Just don't let it rob you of your joy. See, joy is not some feeling. You can't tell someone how to feel. I don't feel good. Well, 
Stop it. Feel better. Well, that's helpful. Thank you, psycho Mark. No, you can't tell someone how to feel. But you can tell someone to find that joy in life that comes from the resurrected Lord. So that even if you're grieving, even if you have sorrow, you know that weeping may last for a night, but rejoicing can come in the morning. You know that there's, the story's not over yet. You know that there are times of struggle. You know that there are times of sweat. You know that there are times of difficulty. You know there are times where you can't figure out how to make ends meet. Or you can't figure out a relationship. Or you can't figure out where you went wrong with your kids and where your kids went wrong with you. Or you can't figure out how to get out of a mess. Or you can't figure out why you lost a spouse or a loved one. Or you can't figure out or you can't figure out. That's okay. But if you know you worship. A resurrected Lord who cares for you, even in the midst of all of the things you can't figure out, you know who can. And you know with confidence, even if it's just shrivelly, mamby-pamby little confidence, you know with confidence He will guide you through. Now the problem is, a lot of us, when life is sunny and the, the wind's behind us and our boat's just zipping along. By the way, I don't really sail boats. I've been in them before and I think they're dangerous. But I've been watching these videos on YouTube before I started trial of these people who just sail around on these little boats. And I think they're all going to die at some point because the boat's going to crash. But they talk about when the sun is out and the wind's behind them and it's a great day for sailing. Well, the problem is if people aren't enjoying that moment in the Lord, then they're not building the foundation that will give them the confidence in God when the storms come. And so they try to have confidence in the Lord when the storm comes, but it's kind of like, well, I've never really put my, given the Lord credit for when it was all good, so I'm not sure he's really going to help me through this. But if you're walking with him when the times are good, then when the times are bad, you can be confident that he who is at work in you will not quit and that rejoicing can come in the morning. And so Paul's able to do it. And don't you know the Philippians were laughing, at least the Philippian jailer? Because you remember, he came to Christ and his family when Paul's locked up in the Philippian jail. And, 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 and at midnight, Paul and Silas, they're singing worship songs in this dank hole, chained up. And an earthquake comes, and the chains break, and the jail breaks open, and the jailer runs. He's, a, I'm sure, at home asleep, but the earthquake, he's running to the jail to see, and he sees that it's open. And he's realizing the Romans will kill him for not having stayed guard overnight as if he knew an earthquake was coming. And he's like, I'm dead now. And Paul shouts out, oh no, we didn't leave. We're in here. We're just singing praise to the Lord. We're just rejoicing in God. And he's, wait, wait a minute, let me get this straight. <clears throat> I've got you locked in a slimy, bug-infested, rodent, rat-bite hole in the ground. It broke open, your chains were broken, and y'all didn't leave? Slip away into the dark night? Paul's like, oh no, we wouldn't do that to you. I mean, your job's on the line, buddy. We're just in here praising the Lord. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. The Philippian jailer says, there's something weird about you. Would you come talk to my house about why you're so weird? And they, Paul tells them about Jesus and they all become believers. I am guarantee you when he's reading this letter and Paul's saying rejoice in the Lord always, he's saying only a guy who's done that in a jail could, sing, could, could do this with cred the way Paul is. Because that's what Paul's saying. In the midst of whatever, and Paul's writing this from a Roman jail, I believe. Tom Wright and some others believe he's in jail in Ephesus, but I think he's in Rome. It's a more common understanding. But regardless, he's writing it from imprisonment. 
So if that's the meaning, what are our points to ponder as we bring the second lesson to a close? Point to ponder number one. We need to remember. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. If you do not have that in your memory bank, Rick didn't grow up in church. I don't know how many of you, I know actually a number of you that did not grow up in church. And it's probably something you've never committed to memory. I'd urge you to commit it to memory. Bruce, I see the Texas A&M shirt. You wore that with pride today. I, I, I say you commit it to memory. Memorize this. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Kyrate in curio pantote. Pollen, ero, kyrate. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Remember that. Daniel's studying. Uh, he's in his first year of med school. Rebecca's fiancé. <laughs> Rebecca came down in the kitchen this morning on her iPhone playing Here Comes the Bride. <laughs> I said, did you sleep well? She said, Dad, I didn't sleep at all. Don't ever let that magical flame of love diminish. Grow in the Lord all of your days together. But always, even in medical school when you're studying for an exam and you're away from your beloved, rejoice in the Lord always. Take joy and happiness in the fact that we worship a risen Lord. He loves you enough to die for you. He loves you enough to come back for you. He loves you enough to be inside you in his, by His Spirit. He loves you enough to take you for eternity. Yeah, but today bites. Well, okay. You're not in eternity yet. You're in the world that bites. Next. Joy is the distinctive mark of the Christian. So Gordon Fee said, Paul, the theologian of grace, is also the theologian of joy. Paul talks about joy. Paul uses joy 16 times in this short letter. Christians should not be sour pusses. I don't know how else to say it. Now look, let's be candid. We're all united here, remember? Some have a disposition of being a sour puss. It's just part of who you are. There, we're not all ee. Some of us are huh. Okay? That's understandable. But all of us take that baseline and rev it up a couple of notches. Because no matter how much your baseline is being a sourpuss, we've got reason to be joyful in the Lord. And that should be the distinctive mark of a Christian. That we love each other and that we're filled with joy. I'm excited. I'm happy. Well, the world's going to pot. Yeah, but I'm not. I'm going to the Lord. No, your life's going to pot. Yeah, but I'm not. Well, yes, you are. Your health is terrible. That's okay. It's going to get better. No, the doctor says it's terminal. That's okay. It's going to get better. I was talking to a gentleman before class who's got a son with some health problems. Bad health problems. First name's Robert. We should pray for him. But he said to me, he said, you know, the end may be near. And my reply in my head, and I think even out loud, was, at least when that end comes, there will be healing. I remember going to church uh, when I was in college. Don Finto was our preacher, and uh, someone came down with cancer and prayed for healing. Everybody got around and prayed for healing. Fella died a couple of days later. Don Finto got up and preached the funeral and said, 
Well, the Lord answered our prayer. Healed that man. Eternally. We'll get a new eternal body. It's exciting and worth rejoicing over. Christian joy is not based on the circumstances of the, or the time of life. Uh, today's a bad day. Some days you're the windshield, some days you're the bug. Today I'm the bug. It's not a good day. Christian joy is not based on circumstances or the time of life. It's a deep-rooted joy based on the Lord's presence right here, right now, and for eternity. Paul will continue, and we'll continue this next week, God willing. When Paul says, part of this, rejoice in the Lord always, again I'll say rejoice, he'll say let your patience or forbearance be known to all people because the Lord is near. you got God right here. That's a reason to rejoice. And you've got the promise that he's coming physically to take you physically home and that's a pretty good twofer so with that let me bless you and it's time for church father I ask your blessings upon my friends my family my my brothers and sisters in you I ask your blessings on anybody outside of this fellowship who watches or listens father may we become the united body of Christ that is a testimony to your love and unity as we live in this world and Lord may we also experience and demonstrate the joy of worshiping a resurrected and loving God we pray these things in the name of Jesus amen see you guys next Sunday God bless you